Good afternoon, whoever that was. <laughs> nice and loud. All right, let's get into the word. Please turn your Bibles, if you have them, to Mark chapter 6, or open up your smartphones or tablets or your bulletins. Mark chapter 6, we are looking at verses 1 through 6 today. If you are new here for the first time or you haven't been around, we have been going through the Gospel of Mark, started somewhere close to the beginning of this year. We've been going through this book for the last 22 weeks. Can you believe that? 22 weeks, and now we are in chapter 6. <laughs> yes, you heard that right if you're new. 22 weeks, and we are only in chapter 6. You heard it right. Which means I know some of you are doing the math right now, and you're calculating, like, when are we going to be finished with this series? And you realize we're probably not going to be finished by the end of the year. Maybe sometime in 2019, who knows, God knows, but uh, it's going to be a while, and I know for some of you, maybe there is some sadness that's beginning to arise because you're recognizing, oh, I'm not going to be here at the end of the year, I'm going back home, like, I'm not going to be able to finish the Gospel of Mark, oh no, right? right? But lucky for you, if that is you, all of our messages are available online on our Facebook page and on our website. And so no matter where you are in the world, you can finish this series with us in 2019 or however long it takes. And for those of you who are new and you've missed 22 weeks, uh, you can binge watch and uh, catch up and uh, track along with us. It's all available to you guys, okay? Uh, but if you are new, let me just tell you, uh, the Gospel of Mark, it is all about who Jesus Christ is, okay? It's all about that. We've said this many times before. The Gospel of Mark is all about who is Jesus. This is the reason that Mark is writing his gospel, and he tells us who he is really from the get-go of, of his gospel. Right in verse 1, gospel is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's who Jesus is, okay? Now, the reason he's telling us this, telling his readers, is not so that we could have some more knowledge about Jesus so that we can have this understanding and know this fact like in our heads, okay, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I got it. This is a great story. That, that's not the reason why he's writing this. He's writing so that we would have faith and believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if this is true, then the only appropriate response for anybody reading, anybody hearing this truth, is to believe in him, to submit to him as the Lord, as the King, to trust him, to put your faith in him. Okay? Any other response is, is just not appropriate. Okay? That's what Mark wants. Okay? Now, in our passage today, in our, in our story, we actually get a very clear picture of how we as hearers shouldn't respond to the truth of who Jesus is, okay? And I really pray that everyone here, everyone here listening to the word of God, that, that no one is here found responding this way, okay? And that's to respond with unbelief, okay? Unbelief. Now, when I say unbelief, I'm not talking about an attitude that maybe says, yeah, I want to believe, but I'm just not sure. I'm seeking. My heart is open. I'm here because I want to study the Word. I want to know more about this Jesus, but I'm just not sure. I'm not there yet. That's okay. That's not unbelief. That's called seeking. Okay? That's a great place to be. If you're there, that's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about unbelief, we're talking about an attitude that says, yeah, I've heard that Jesus is the Son of God. I've read through the Bible. I've listened to all the messages. I know who he is, but I refuse to believe him. I refuse to give my life fully to him. I refuse to trust him. I reject him. That's what we're talking about when we say unbelief. And I hope nobody responds that way today. Okay? This is how we see the people of Nazareth responding to Jesus. If you didn't know, Nazareth is Jesus' hometown. It's the place that he uh, grew up. So most of his life he spent there in Nazareth. And you know the saying, uh, there's a popular saying, home is where the heart is. You know that saying? If you don't know what that saying means, it pretty much means like wherever you grew up, the place that you were born, it always has like this special place in your heart, no matter where you are in the world. Like maybe you're living in such an awesome place like Hawaii or something, but you're always just thinking about home. Like, oh, one day I want to just go back home. That, that's what it means when we say home is where the heart is. But for Jesus, 
I think it is much more accurate to say that home is where the hard is. Okay, and that's the title of today's message. Home is where the hard is because that's exactly what we see in this story as Jesus goes home to his hometown, right? Just think about that, going home to my friends and family. But he really, right, what we find out is it's a hard place to do ministry. It is a place full of hard, unbelieving hearts. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at this as a case study, look at this story and see why this is and also what we could possibly learn for us today from this story. So Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We're going to get into this now. We're going to be reading from the ESV. You guys ready? Yes. All right. This is the word of the Lord. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? Where is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Uh, Father of creation, we humble ourselves before you. We worship you this day. We recognize that you are God and there is none like you. There is no other that is worthy of praise. There is no other that is worthy of all of our lives. And so today we want to humbly give it to you. We want to listen to your word, listen to your instruction with open ears. But Lord, we know that oftentimes we have deaf ears and we need your spirit to open up our ears. And so we humbly ask, please, Spirit of God, Open up our ears to hear the truth. Open up our eyes to see the wonder of who you are. Open up our hearts, soften any hardness that may be there right now, any distractions, Lord, let them be gone in Jesus' name. We just ask for your help at this moment because we know your word produces life and we want life that you came for us to have. And so help us now and would you be honored as we listen and apply your word in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So over the last three weeks, we've been seeing some incredible, powerful demonstrations of Jesus' authority, have we not? You remember, uh, we saw a few weeks ago, Jesus calming the hurricane, a raging hurricane, literally just telling the hurricane, be quiet, stay quiet, and calm. We saw Jesus uh, cast out a legion, an army of demons from, an un- you know, from a man and completely restoring this man simply with a word. And then last week, we talked about how Jesus, not only did he uh, heal a woman who was he- bleeding for 12 years simply by her just touching him, power leaving him, that kind of faith, but he also raised a 12-year-old dead girl from death to life, just taking her by the hands, telling her, get up. So we've seen all of this this, this amazing power from Jesus over the last three weeks. And then now in today's passage, he takes his disciples to his hometown of Nazareth. And the reason that he's doing this is because he wants to prepare his disciples for what's going to happen next week. Okay, what we'll talk about next week. Next week, we're going to see that Jesus sends the disciples out. Finally, you know, they've been training, they've been watching Jesus do all these miracles, healing, teaching, and then next week he actually sends them out. And the reason that he wants to bring him home is because he wants to teach them a very valuable lesson in his hometown. And the lesson is this. Ministry is hard. <laughs> very, very hard. And unbelief, rejection from people that you would expect to believe should be expected. Okay? Okay. Because really, his disciples, after everything they've seen, they're probably thinking in their head, ministry is going to be a piece of cake. We just talk to a hurricane, and it'll calm down. We just tell demons to leave, and they'll leave. And we just touch a woman who's been bleeding, she'll be cured. Easy piece of cake, and no better place to go than home for Jesus to teach them. Not going to be easy. 
Okay, so that's why he brings them to Nazareth. Okay, so um, Nazareth, I just want to give you a quick background. Okay, if you didn't know, again, Jesus grew up in this place. It's about 40 kilometers or 25 miles to the southwest of Capernaum. Uh, I have a map here for those of you who are more visual. Uh, you can see the Sea of Galilee. Can you see that? It's kind of small, but if you see the, the blue, that's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, on the top left is a city called Capernaum, where he's doing most of his ministry. And then if you just follow down to the southwest, 25 kilometers, if you can measure that, you see a place called Nazareth, and that's where Jesus grew up most of his life. The first 30 years or so, he grew up there. Now, about this Nazareth, it is a small, obscure, little town. Okay. Scholars estimate that the, there were maybe 500 people at most who lived in this town. It's kind of like the town that nobody has ever heard of. It's, it's that kind of town, like a hick town, if you will. Okay. So 500 people, if you think about that, if we were to combine our first service and second service, if everybody was here together, that's about how many people lived in Nazareth, like the whole New Harvest ministry. Um, and so the reason I say that is it means that everybody knew everybody in Nazareth. Okay. Everyone knew each other. It was a small town. For those of you who grew up in big towns like myself, you might not understand that. You might not be able to conceive, like, how could everybody in a city know each other? But if you grew up in a small town, any small town people here? Yeah, all right, you guys. You probably know better than I do that this could, is possible, where you, everybody knows of each other, okay? 500 people. I remember meeting a, a brother from New Harvest Ministry, actually. He was a guy from Ireland. So, some of you may know him. I don't think he's here anymore. Uh, but I remember meeting him and him telling me that he was from a small town in Ireland for uh, like 50 to 100 people. It's a really, really small town. And one of the things he was telling me is he hated it. He absolutely hated living in this small town because everybody knew everybody. Right? And he was telling me like all they would do is just talk about each other. Right? You'd have these grandmas who are like sitting out on the porch and all they're doing is just gossiping about the other people. Right? And he hated this so much that that's the reason he left this town and came to Korea. Right? He didn't like that it was a small town. So it's kind of like how it is in Nazareth. Right? Now I don't know if they were all sitting around gossiping about each other, but the point is that they all knew each other. Everyone knew who Jesus was. They had seen him grow up. They knew his brothers. They knew his family. They knew all about him. They knew what he did. They knew him, everyone. And now, they've heard reports about this Jesus. They heard the reports about the teaching and the miracles and all these wonderful things happening by him, him claiming to even be the Messiah, claiming to be God. Is he crazy? And now he's home. He's come home. And that's sort of the setting, uh, the setting or situation of our passage. And so as Jesus comes home, we see the first thing he's doing is he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath teaching. And we've seen him do this before. According to the Gospel of Luke, this was his custom. Every Saturday on the Sabbath, he would pretty much go to the synagogue, which is like the local church, and he would preach. He would teach. He would open up the Word of God, and he would teach, te kind of like what I'm doing here. Okay. Only difference is that when Jesus preached, nobody was looking at their smartphones. Okay. Nobody was sleeping. Nobody was checking uh, what, what's the score, the latest on the score, or what, oh, that's the email came in. Nobody was doing that because they were all getting blown away. Okay. Every time Jesus would open his mouth and preach from, the word, from his word, people were astonished. They were amazed. They were blown away every time. Okay. Now, you know, as pastors, one of, one of the things that pastors like to do is we, we like to use this um, analogy using baseball to kind of judge how good a sermon is. Okay, we, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but a lot of pastors will do this when we're judging, like, how good is a sermon, we'll use baseball terms. So if, if we hit a single, it's kind of like, all right, that was not a bad sermon. Like, you didn't say anything heretical. Like, you were pretty accurate. But, you know, most people were sleeping. But still, it's a single, not bad. You didn't do a bad job, right? And then, and then like, if you hit a double, it's like... Now, that was a pretty good sermon. Like some, I could see some people were convicted. Some people were sleeping, but for the most part, you know, it's pretty good. You hit a triple, and maybe, maybe you start seeing people crying, <laughs> like Holy Spirit is moving. The truth is really impacting. And then home run, man. The home run is just like Holy Spirit came upon this place. People are walking away changed, right? I got, I got to live for God. Right? That's like the home run. Mind's blown. Like, oh, my, this is amazing. Okay. 
I don't think I've ever hit a home run before. <laughs> I don't know if I ever will, okay? But Jesus, I mean, pretty much every time he's preaching, he's just, bam, hitting home runs, home runs, home runs. I mean, he's just calling them out. People are getting blown away. If Jesus were here preaching right now, I mean, seriously, you guys would be blown away. I can't wait for the day we hear Jesus teaching, <laughs> like show, teaching us about himself. I mean, we're going to be blown away, okay? And it's no different here in Nazareth. I mean, he comes home to Nazareth. It says on the Sabbath, verse 2, on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished. Astonished. That's the word for blown away. Their minds were blown. Okay. But here's the thing. This isn't a, wow, this is amazing. Like, I, I need to hear more of this. This is not that kind of astonishment. This is more of a, huh? What? This guy? I don't believe this kind of astonishment. Okay. Because they're asking questions like this in verse 2. They say, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? In other words, how in the world is this possible from this guy? You notice they don't even use his name Jesus. It's just this guy. Are you kidding me? How did he get this wisdom? How is he doing these miracles? They simply cannot believe in him. And it's not because they don't know him. It's because they know him too well. They're so familiar with him, okay? And that's what they're getting at in verse 3. They, they ask, verse 3, is not this the carpenter? I mean, isn't this the guy who made our tables? Isn't this the guy who made our furniture, our beds, our chairs? I mean, this guy? Really? Right? And then they go on to reference Jesus' family. Isn't this Mary's son? Which, by the way, is a very strange way to refer to someone by calling him the son of his mother. At that time, you would refer to someone as the son of their father. That was the common practice. Okay, if I was living at that time, I would be known as Eddie, the son of Andrew. That's my, my father's name, okay? I wouldn't be known as Eddie, the, the son of Elizabeth. That's my mom's name, okay? And so here, we would expect, isn't this the son of Joseph? But they call him the son of Mary. Well, what's going on here? Now, I, I was doing some research on this, and some commentators say that uh, the reason for this is because Joseph is dead by now, and Mary is more well-known, and so that's why uh, they, they call him son of Mary. But some others think that implicit in this statement is the rumor that's been around ever since the beginning. Hey, did you hear? Mary is pregnant. Wait a second, isn't Mary not married? Isn't she just betrothed? You, she's not married. What? Is this an illegitimate child? Maybe this is a bastard. Right? Implicit in there is this rumor. Right? And, and I don't know if it's, if it's the first or the second. I don't know what, what the case is, but whatever the truth is, why they're calling him son of Mary, it's not a compliment. It's not a compliment. This is an insult. Okay. And then they don't stop there. They, they continue with the rest of the family. Isn't this the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and, and are not his sisters here with us? Right? In other words, we know this man's entire family. We know all of them and there's nothing special about them at all. They're just ordinary. Just plain. They're ordinary nobodies, all of them. Okay? Now, mind you, some of these names would actually become very significant figures in the church later on. For example, James. We know James, he becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. He's the one who wrote the book of James, this guy, later on. And then there's Judas, who most scholars believe is the author of the book of Jude. Okay. And if you're asking the question, like, why, why is it not called the book of Judas? Simple answer, after Judas Iscariot, nobody wants to be called Judas anymore, okay? I mean, with well reason. They, they shortened their name to Jude, so that's why, okay? So some of his family, yes, they would become notable later, but at this point, they're nobodies. They're nobodies, okay? Ordinary people. And not only that, they themselves don't even believe in Jesus, his own family who grew up with him 30 years, who saw him 
don't believe in Jesus. You remember that? We, we saw this earlier in Mark 3 when his family hears reports of Jesus. They think he's crazy, and so they actually go to try to seize him and bring him home saying he's out of his mind. They don't believe in him. Right? Even in John 7, we, it says very clearly, even his own brothers did not believe in Jesus. They didn't believe him. They thought he was crazy. Okay? And, and I, I kind of get it because I have two older brothers. You know, if my oldest brother, I, I heard... You know, in America right now, he's telling people he's God. I'm probably going to think he's crazy too. So, you know, I, I, you can't blame them for thinking this way. But this is all of Nazareth. Everybody, their friends, his friends, his families, they all don't believe in Jesus because they simply know him too well. And in fact, not only do they know him so well, they're actually offended by him. Right? That's what it says. They, they took offense at him. Okay? It's the word in the Greek, skandalizo. Okay? What does that word sound like? Scandal. Yeah, it's where we get the word scandal from. Okay. Only it doesn't really mean scandal in the way that we think. Um, it actually means a stumbling block. Okay. So it's as if uh, they are stumbled and repelled by Jesus. Okay. So every single time Mark uses this word scandalizo, it's always referring to something that prevents someone from believing and following Jesus. Whatever that is, Whatever that stumbling block is, that's the scandalizo, okay? And so here, in, for the friends and family of Nazareth, the stumbling block is that they just, they know him too well. They're so familiar with him, right? It's not that they have an issue with his teaching. They're astonished by that. It's, it's that it's Jesus. Jesus, this guy. I mean, we grew up with this guy. We went to synagogue every single week with this guy. We ate with this guy. We played with this guy. We, we know him so very well. He's so familiar. Okay. And in order to explain to the people why this is a stumbling block to them, Jesus, he quotes this very famous uh, sort of proverb. It says in verse 4, a, pro a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And we have a very similar saying today. It's familiarity breeds contempt. Right? You know that saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Okay. One, of, one of the ways to understand that is that uh, the more familiar you are with something, the less respect and amazement you have with that thing. Okay? And, and that's so true in our lives, is it not? I mean, I think about the first time I came to Korea, the very first time when I came, my very first year in Korea, there was um, one thing that I really loved, uh, a place that I just really adored, and it was just amazing to me. It was a place called Kimbap Cheonguk. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, but this, this is, you guys know this place. If you don't, check it out. But I really was amazed by Kimbap Cheonguk because, you know, I was working full time. My first year in Korea it was really hard, no time to make dinner, but on my way home, there was this kimbap chungguk, and you go in there, and you pull out like 5,001, and I, I got not just one tuna kimbap, or, but two, right? You can get two tuna kimbaps, and uh, kimbap was so amazing to me because it's really like the, like the perfect meal in one thing, you know? You got the carbs, you got the veggies, you got the meat. I mean, everything is right there, and it comes out in like 30 seconds or less, and it tastes great. And so I would have it like every day. I'm a little bit ashamed to admit this, but every single day, and every time I go there, the lady, she knew me, you know, after a while, she's like, two kimbap, yep. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just loved it. Kimbap chungu. Oh, so wonderful. Been here seven years now, and uh, I don't want to go anywhere near a kimbap chungu. <laughs> like, kimbap chungu, that place is junk. You know what I mean? Like, I lost the, the amazement of it because there's just so much more out there, right? But, but I mean, you see the point. Familiarity breeds contempt, and, and it's not just in our physical lives that we experience this. This relates to our spiritual lives as well, right? Because we can become so familiar with Jesus that we cease to be amazed, we cease to be impressed by him. Okay. Maybe for some of us, maybe we've been coming to church for so long, every single week and listening to the messages and you're like, yeah, there's nothing really new about that. I've, I've heard that before. Yeah, God died for me. Yeah, he loves me. Yeah, my sins are forgiven. I get that. Just so familiar, all of these things. You read the Bible, it's just all these stories. So familiar that you just lose the wonder and you lose the awe of who Jesus really is. There's just no more excitement to live for him, no desire to pursue him and to live for his name. Okay? And maybe, maybe some of you here today, you're, you're experiencing this as well. Okay? 
And usually those who need to guard against this the most are those who grew up going to church, like myself. You've, you've been Christians for a long time. We, we're the ones that need to guard against this the most. Okay? Because the reality is that if, if we are at a place where Jesus ceases to amaze us, who he is, God incarnate in the flesh, I mean, the king of the universe, the one who created everything, the almighty living God in the flesh, like who he is, if that ceases to amaze us, we are in a dangerous place. Okay? And if what he has done for us ceases to amaze us, like we, just, we, we hear about the cross and, and what he did upon the cross, and, and yeah, we know he rose again, and, and amazing grace just no longer is amazing to us, we are in a dangerous place. Because it means our hearts have gotten very hard. Our hearts have gotten very cold. And if we're not careful, we could end up at a place where we end up rejecting Christ, just like the hometowners did. We're just so familiar with Jesus. Now, if you're there, the question is, what do I do then? What do I do? If I've lost the wonder, if I'm just so familiar with Jesus and I don't have this wonder anymore, what do I do? Very simple. I'm going to tell you. Repent. Turn to Jesus. Repent. Pray. Ask him, help me, Lord. He, he knows the condition you're in. I mean, it's not surprising to him. He knows. Ask him. Okay. One of the things that you can pray, I mean, I, I love this. This is a prayer. Maybe you can even write this down. It's King David's prayer. It comes from Psalm chapter 17, verses 6 to 7. I recommend that every one of us, we, we're praying this every single day. Okay? But this is what King David is praying. A man after God's own heart. He prays this. Psalm chapter 17, verses 6 and 7. He says, I call on you, my God for you will answer me, I believe. Right? Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. And then this is what he asks. He says, show me the wonder of your great love. Show me the wonders of your great love. Show me more, God. I know that there's got to be more. Right? Because that's what your word says. The word says that his love is never ending. We could never know the heights or the depths or the breadth of his love. We gotta just keep asking. And so King David here, he's asking, show me the wonders of your great love. I wanna know more. I'm too familiar with what I've known in the past. I wanna know more, God. Right? This is a prayer we should be praying every day. There's so much more to God than what we know. Believe me. So much more. And so pray this. I recommend every time you wake up in the morning, pray this. Show me the wonders of your great love. And you know what? He's gonna answer you. You know how I know this? He wants to answer this for you. You know how I know because he prays this for you. Did you know that? He prays this for every single one of us. We see this. John chapter 17, verse 24. John 17, 24, Jesus praying to the Father. What does he pray for us? He says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Why? And to see my glory. This is what he wants for every single one of us. He wants you to see his glory. He wants you to know him in deeper ways. He wants you to know the power of his love, the depths of his love for you. You just got to ask him, Lord, give me more. Show me. Okay. But the thing is, you got to believe. Your job is to ask and believe that he's going to do this. Believe that his word is true. That just as we sing, all his promises are yes and amen. They're not like maybe, uh, no, I'm not going to keep my promise. No, yes, he promises it. So you got to believe this. Okay? Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You must believe that he exists and that he earnestly rewards you when you seek him. You just got to believe this, that he's good and he wants to show you. Okay? The people of Nazareth, the problem is they don't believe. And because they don't believe, they don't receive. Okay? You can Twitter that. You don't believe, you don't receive. <laughs> they don't believe, they don't receive. We see this. Verse 5. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Okay. 
Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have the ability to heal the entire town of Nazareth, that somehow the unbelief of Nazareth sort of like sucked his power out, like, ah, and then he, he couldn't perform miracles, like, oh, I can only heal a couple people, I'm so weak. No, that's not what it means, okay? He could only heal a few people because of the shocking amount of unbelief that was there. That, that's the point. It's highlighting the shocking unbelief of Nazareth, his own hometown, where he could only heal a few people. Right? Now, for Jesus, that's like a bad day in ministry. <laughs> you know, a, talk about some kind of bad day, like you only were able to heal a few people. You know? you can imagine if here we healed, healed a few people, like right now, it's like, whoa, that was an amazing day of ministry. I mean, did you hear what happened? But for Jesus, I mean, in the scope of what we've seen him do, I mean, this is a like kind of bad day, right? Only able to heal a few people. But it's because of the unbelief, the amount of unbelief that's in his own hometown. It's so surprising, it's so unbelievable that it causes Jesus to marvel. It says that he marveled because of their unbelief. He was amazed. He was shocked. He was awestruck. He had an OMG moment. Can you believe this? I don't believe this. Are you kidding me? Kind of moment. You know that there's only two times in the entire Gospels where Jesus marvels. Did you know that? Only two times that this happens. Okay? The first time it happens, or one time that it happens, is when Jesus uh, heals the, the centurion's servant okay, who's sick. The Roman centurion servant, he sends his uh, guards to, to go to Jesus, and, and then he says, you know, you don't have to come, just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marvels, says, wow, what faith you have. And he heals them. Right? And the second time is here. He marvels at the unbelief of his own hometown. Okay? Now, I think what this seems to mean is that there are two things that really surprise Jesus. Two things. One is when people believe when it is not expected that they should believe. Jesus says, wow. Right? But the second is that when people disbelieve when there's every reason to believe, he says, wow. Right? Now the question that I want all of us to be asking ourselves is, has Jesus ever marveled at you? Is Jesus marveling at you right now? Okay. Now, some of you sitting here, I believe that Jesus is marveling at you in a good way. Okay. There are some of you here, I'm sure, that you've just, you've gone through some serious stuff. You have a really hard background, hard family situation. You came out of addiction, drugs, maybe alcohol, all these things. There's just no reason for you to have believed. Maybe you were not exposed to the gospel at a young age. Just all the odds against you. And yet, here you are clinging to Jesus, seeking him, believing in him. And I believe Jesus, he just stands back and he says, wow, amazing faith. And there's no reason to believe. I mean, your life is so difficult, but you still believe. He marvels at you. But I think that there's others in this room where Jesus is marveling for a different reason. And it's not a good reason. But right? perhaps you have had every, and you have every reason to believe. Okay? You grew up in a Christian, God-fearing family. Your parents taught you at a young age the Bible. They took you to church. You, you've listened and you've been exposed to the gospel from a young age, heard hundreds of messages, hung out with Christian friends, went to the summer camps, went to the mission trips, went to retreats and, and, and experienced God's love, and yet still here you are struggling. Say, no, I, I don't believe. I don't give my life fully to Jesus. I refuse to believe in him. I believe Jesus just marvels and says, wow. After everything, you still don't believe. Right? There's still no real fervency for Christ. There's still no real effort to get to know him. There's still no striving to obey him, no desire to follow him. I believe Jesus marvels. Shocking. Yeah. You know, sometimes we think that it's our, our sin, our dark sins, our addictions, like some of the evil thoughts that we have, like, oh man, those are the things that really shock God. Like, oh my goodness, if he really knew the things that I was thinking about, I mean, surely he would not accept me. No. 
Those are not the things that shock Jesus. He knows all of those things. That's why he died on the cross, because he knew how wicked we were. He knows that all. That's not what surprises him. What really surprises him is hardness of heart, unwillingness to believe and put your trust in him when there's every reason to believe in him. Now today, uh, I want to end with this. If you're here today and you recognize, yeah, I think that's me. I think, I think Jesus is marveling at me. Not for a good reason. I, I, I think that he's surprised because I'm just continuing to not believe in him. If that's you, there's, there's two things that I want to say. And, and I'm preaching to myself as well, so please don't feel like I'm calling you. I'm calling myself too. Okay? But two things. And the first thing is not an easy thing. Okay? The first thing I want to say is that you and I are in danger of ultimately being rejected by Jesus if we don't turn and repent. Turn from our unbelief and believe in Jesus Christ. Danger. Okay. One of the things we notice about this story is, from what we know, this is the last time that Jesus goes to his hometown. Okay. The, the last time. We don't see him go back to his hometown and minister to them again. I mean, this is it. And perhaps for some of us, you know, who knows how long we have? Who knows how long God is giving us, how long he's being patient with us to, for us to finally turn and say, Lord, I repent. I believe in you. I trust in you. You are who you say you are. Okay. And so if you just continue and continue and continue to repent, or continue to disbelieve, you're in danger of ultimately being rejected by God if you don't repent. Now, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is there's really, 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 really good news. Really, 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 really good news because today, right now in this moment, you have an opportunity by the mercy of God, by the grace of God to confess your need and repent and receive his grace through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This right now is an opportunity. You could, have been, you could have rejected Jesus a thousand times, said a thousand times, I don't believe, but right now in this moment, if you turn and you humble yourself and you say, Jesus, I need you. I, 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 I don't believe. I need you to help me. He will accept you. He will never turn you away if you humble yourself and repent. He will never cast you away. He promises that no matter how many times you've rejected him, right? He'll accept you if you do it. And so today, that's your opportunity, okay? And I'm sorry to say, actually, you know, you even being here today, hearing this kind of message, it actually gives Jesus more reason to marvel at you if you walk away and don't repent. I'm sorry to say, some of you are like, I shouldn't have come today. I shouldn't have come to listen to this message. But th that's the reality. The more you're, you know, the more you're gonna be held accountable. And so I'm telling you now, okay? Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to, to give you life. He wants to give you grace. He wants to restore you. He wants to love you. He's given that opportunity to every single one of us, no matter where you are. Okay? You may think you're the furthest away from God, but you're never too far from the grace of God if you humble yourself. Because okay? the reality is, the reason that Jesus came is because you and I didn't believe. Right? That's why he came. The reason Jesus went to the cross is because you and I didn't believe. That's why he went to the cross. And the reason that Jesus rose again on the third day from that cross is so that you and I could believe. So we could look at the, the, the empty tomb and say, I believe, right? If you're having some trouble believing, I just recommend that you do some study on the resurrection. Just, just do some study. Just do some research. Because it's pretty dang convincing that Jesus is alive. I'm not just saying this as a pastor. I mean, I'm, this is even worldly people knowing, understanding this. There's, where is the body? Where is he? Where did he go? Why did all his disciples d suddenly decide, I'm going I'm to die for my faith? Like his brothers and sisters, we talked about earlier, they didn't believe. How in the world are they found in Acts worshiping Jesus as God all of a sudden? What's the explanation behind all of that? Jesus is who he says he is. That's the only explanation. How is it that James, who grew up 30 years of his life, my brother's crazy, my brother's crazy, I don't believe in him. Suddenly he rises from the dead, he's in the early church saying, I will die for Jesus, he's the son of God. How is it possible? 
because Jesus is who he says he is. So believe, brothers and sisters. He's calling every one of us today, just repent and believe. I don't care where you are in your faith. If you just repent, humble yourself, and believe, I will accept you. I will accept you. I will love you forever and ever. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Lord, you're amazing. You are so good to us. Lord, you never give up on us. Even in the midst of our rebellion and sin. Time and time again, Lord, we've rejected you. We've chosen to live our own way for our own kingdom, for our own desires. Lord, time and time again, we've done this. But Lord, you have not rejected us. You continue to offer us grace. You continue to offer us healing. You continue to offer us life through the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the glorious invitation, even right now, to turn from our unbelief and to turn to you, to repent and have life in you. We give you thanks, and I pray for every single person here that there would be a response that your Holy Spirit just drives our hearts to do, to turn from our unbelief and say, I believe. And Lord, if there are those here that, that are just so familiar with you, that have heard all these stories, and yeah, I've, you know, I've heard these kinds of sermons, but Lord, I still, it's just having trouble, then Lord, we want to believe, but help our unbelief, we pray. Help us. Because Lord, we know the path of unbelief is just death, destruction. There's no life apart from you. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would help us and cause us to turn to you. We know that you do not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Lord, you desire for us to turn to you and have life. And so, Lord, may your sons and daughters and may our friends and family maybe here today that don't know you, may they turn from death to the living God. By the power of your Spirit, help us to respond in the right way. Lord, we do not want you to marvel at us for the wrong reason. Week after week, hearing your truth. Week after week, studying your word. Week after week, hanging out with Christians and talking about you. But there just being no passion or zeal for you. No commitment to you, Lord. We don't want you to marvel at us in that way, Lord. We want to be sons and daughters who, no matter what circumstances we go through, no matter how hard life may get, no matter how much the world may tell us that this is not true, Lord, we still believe. We cling to the truth because we've seen we see the grave is empty. The tomb is empty. You have risen and you're coming again. Help us to be those sorts of servants, Lord, that you may marvel at us and be pleased with us, Lord, as we live our lives for you. Help us. We cannot do it on our own strength. Lord, we don't want to even try to do it on our own strength. We need your spirit, God. We need your Holy Spirit. Empower us. Continue to drive us to the cross in our weakness. May we just continue to be driven to the gospel, driven to your mercy, driven to your grace, that we would never leave you. God. Help us, God. We ask and we pray. We thank you for your word. The warning you give us, the comfort, encouragement, the challenge you give us, we know you do it to us because you love us. You want us to know the truth. And so we give you thanks for your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would receive glory. The response from this message, you would receive glory. Faith would arise. We pray these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters.